Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We're going to get started in one minute. We're going to have to... Good evening, and welcome to Hudson Institute's Stern Policy Center. I'm John Walters, Hudson's Chief Operating Officer. And I'd like to welcome our audience here at our Pennsylvania Avenue headquarters and our C-SPAN audience to our first ever podcast taping that is both live and marks the second season of the pre premiere uh, of, uh, podcast of the second season of The Realignment, hosted by Hudson Media Fellows, Marshall Kosloff and Sager and Jetty. Uh, we are proud of The Realignment here at Hudson. Uh, a podcast launched last year, and I recommend especially for those of you who haven't been uh, uh, following it, that you take a look at the uh, episodes from last year, particularly the conversation with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Josh Hawley, uh, Chris, Ar Chris Arnotti, Mike Gallagher, Mike Duran, and others. Um, it's, a, it's an excellent uh, uh, um, program, partly because of the two people who put it together and their ability to kind of bring out topics and, and, and to uh, move the argument along. So we couldn't be prouder of the work that they've done, and I want to thank them for, for that. And uh, um, we are happy to launch this year's uh, um, program with Michael Lind, who is, uh, as many of you know, a prolific writer of more than a dozen books and co-founder of the New America Foundation with Hudson's own Ravenel B. Curry Distinguished Fellow in Strategy and Statesmanship, Walter Russell Mead. Michael is a professor at Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas. And important for tonight's conversation, he is the author of The New Class War, Saving Democracy from the Managerial Elite. Uh, the book, which you can purchase the back, was just published today. So uh, we're here at the at the launch. Congratulations, Michael, on the, on the, on the public, a new book. Um, there's a direct line between the new class war and the work that Michael has done and been pursuing since the 90s, maybe best exemplified or known by his book, The Next American Revolution, The New Nationalism, and The Fourth American Revolution. Sorry, The Next Amer American Nation, The New Nationalism, and The Fourth American Revolution. Whether you agree with his interpretation of Western politics since World War II, his work demonstrates a serious effort to understand the causes of and the solutions to the seemingly never-ending cycle of clashes and shifting coalitions, which is exactly what our Realignment podcast seeks to explore. Also joining us is J.D. Vance, who fittingly was the Realignment's premier guest. Uh, J.D., of course, is the author of the best-selling and highly influential book, Hillbilly Elegy, a powerful account of family, community, and America. His, he recently co-founded uh, Narnia Capital, a venture capital firm investing in people and technologies working to solve significant challenges. He's also a visiting fellow at AEI. Uh, I have not, I've only started, as I told Michael, uh, his book. I have, of course, read J.D. Vance's book, which is, if you haven't, you should. Uh, it's, an, it's an important uh, discussion of um, a part of America that uh, maybe uh, someone like Charles Murray would say is outside the bubble of the uh, elite and chattering classes. Uh, at the beginning of Michael's new book, he says, 
uh, demagogic populism is a symptom. Technocratic neoliberalism is the disease. Democratic pure, pur pluralism is the cure. I'm not sure if that is a throwdown for this evening with uh, a room full of people in Washington, DC, but um, um, we are pleased to, to start from that discussion and to take on that issue with his help. Uh, we will take questions later in the, uh, in the program, and you can email those to events at hudson.org, and uh, we'll get them up to the, um, to the, uh, uh, to Marshall and Sagar to, uh, to use as we get to that part of the program. So please send them along. Everybody in here is, I know, technically sophisticated, so this will not be a problem. Um, and without any further ado, uh, let me uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Michael Lind and J.D. Vance. One quick note, uh, Michael's going to be available after the talk to sign books, so if you found this great, it'd be great to take a second to get some of those afterwards. Yeah, exactly. And just to reiterate, if you have any questions, events at Hudson.org. I'm sure you all get sick of hearing us talk, so at that point, I'll let you, uh, well, I'll speak for you and fire your questions. Uh, with that, Marshall, why don't you start us off? So the book is called The New Class War, Saving Democracy from the Managerial Elite. First question, let's define terms. What is a class war? Well, a class war is a uh, conflict among uh, quasi-hereditary classes uh, where your, social, your parentage is associated with a particular structure of occupations. Uh, and, and we think we live in a meritocratic system. But if you look at what I argue is the fundamental cleavage in modern transatlantic societies, which is uh, educational, it's not a matter of mere uh, after-tax income, uh, <clears throat> there's any, uh, uh, you're much more likely to get a diploma if one or both of your parents had diplomas, which are kind of the new degrees of uh, uh, nobility, uh, than if uh, both of your parents uh, did not. So I argue that uh, in Europe, as well as uh, the United States, I think both sides of the Atlantic are uh, similar enough now uh, to make robust generalizations. That wouldn't have been the case 40, 50 years ago. But as Europe has become more multi-ethnic, as uh, the United States has become more secular, I think there's some convergence. And what you see is uh, arguably this a widening divide socially and politically between the college educated and the more or less two thirds uh, majority, which does not have a, even a bachelor's degree. J JD, do you agree with that take? Because to interpret what you're saying, it seems like you're suggesting that unlike in previous eras, class status as denoted by education matters more than income in terms of explaining like, the way our society works and explaining the hierarchy. Well, well, yes and no. Uh, the average American who has a bachelor's degree has an income of about 60000 a year. Uh, the average high school uh, graduate with no higher education is about 37000 So there is a correlation. But uh, unlike in the past, where class status was based on ownership of property, uh, whether you were a feudal landlord and you own land, or you were a Ebenezer Scrooge small business owner and you, you were the owner operator of a business, the elites in the Western world today, largely uh, their wealth and their power and their status tends to come from their position in a large bureaucratic organization. It can be a corporation, it can be a law firm, it can be a nonprofit, uh, it can be the military. Uh, and access to those lucrative, influential positions is largely determined by education. What do you think, JD? Because I think that one of the common retorts to that is like, well, you know, it's not. Why is it education is the great denoter of class? You could have, I mean, Michael and I were speaking this morning. He talked about a plumber. He said a plumber could make you know, hundred thousand dollars. He could be rich. But he could be rich and still working class. Based on your own experience, how how do you see that cleavage in American society? Yeah. So. I think I largely agree with Mike. Um, and first of all, let me thank you both for doing this. Uh, next time you have me on the podcast, please tell me which color the couch is. <laughs> um, but I, I think that what's true about Mike's account, I, I don't know that I 100% agree with it, but I like 95% agree with it. What's, what's, what seems to me mostly true about that account is that if you go to you know, a, a suburb in Cincinnati, Ohio, and you go to a plumbing firm, and you go to the guy who owns the firm, and you go to the, the people who work there, and then you go to the clerical staff, um, 
there's something much more similar about that group of people, about their spouses, about their children, than there is um, you know, between, let's say, the owner of the plumbing supply firm and a person who's a majority or a large shareholder at Google, for example. And so I, I do think that there's something about the way in which educational status, status both confers but also sort of reinforces and signifies class status uh, that's really important in our society. And of course, you know, most people do not, I mean, the gross majority of people cannot earn their living off of capital appreciation. And so there is this weird way in which what Mike calls the professional managerial class is sort of internally coherent, even though it might not have, you know, the, the, the sort of the person at the 91st percentile of the income scale is not going to have the same income as the person at the 99.9th percentile of the income scale. Right. So, Mike, to, tell, to tie a bow on this, on the managerial class, I mean, people throw it around on the progressive left. It's like a slur, the professional managerial class. Who are these people in particular? You call, characterize them as a large bureaucratic organization. Is it a corporate elite, government, or is it just the, the, in, in the transatlantic sense? What is it that defines them as a, as a class? Well, there are different definitions. The left has something it calls the PMC, the professional mm. managerial class, which refers, in my mind, to simply a small subfaction of, of the managerial elite. And these tend to be people in the, uh, uh, the professions where you more or less set your own hours, lawyers, uh, doctors, more in the past than, than present, professors. Podcast uh, hosts. Podcast hosts. <laughs> and if you can work from home, basically. So, so this kind of progressive theory is there are three classes. There's the working class. There's the professional managerial class, the podcasters, and the professors. And then there's the capitalists right up there, and, and I reject this. I, I follow uh, James Burnham, the uh, uh, Trotskyist and early conservative uh, movement leader <coughs> of the 1940s who wrote the book, The Managerial Revolution. Uh, he argued that the independent owner operator who uh, was the capitalist but also ran the, you know, his own business had been superseded already by the 1920s in the US and in Europe by corporate managers, but he also included in the managerial class uh, government officials, career civil servants, uh, uh, academics, and in a passage that few people note in the managerial revolution in 1940, he said the career military, the uniform military, which would become more and more important over time as one of the most organized, so long before the deep state, right, uh, of which he was kind of part of because he, he worked for the CIA a lot <laughs> in the uh, in, ensuing uh, decade. Uh, so I have a broader definition of it. Uh, than, than a lot of people do. But again, it's, and then if you contrast it with the uh, working class, the working class is changing the, its, its nature because of the changing composition of jobs. Uh, part of it through loss of manufacturing, through outsourcing, but also just through ordinary productivity growth. Uh, manufacturing has shed a lot of jobs. Uh, if you look at the United States, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Almost all of the new jobs are created in three sectors. It's uh, leisure and hospitality, retail, and healthcare. Uh, and uh, uh, according to the US government, of all of, of the top 10 jobs that are being created in, in numerical terms, only registered nurse requires any education beyond a high school diploma. So the story that we are told at Davos and Aspen, and, and uh, not here, of course. And we're all better we were invited, obviously. <laughs> yeah, the, the jobs of the future require advanced education and all of that. Actually, they don't. Uh, um, Americans and their counterparts, in, uh, working class counterparts in Europe, are underpaid. They are not overeducated. And my argument in the new class war is they are underpaid because they lack bargaining power of the kind that they possessed uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. So. Before we move on, I think the thing that I haven't quite understood yet from the conversation is the war part, right? So what is it? We could, we could buy that there's a, an educational system that preferences people with degrees. We could buy the idea that certain industries are favored over others. But where's the war? A war suggests that there's a, a group of people, this elite, that is not only looking down upon the working class, but actively trying to harm them to benefit themselves. Where, and I'm curious mm -hmm. what your take on that is too, JD. Well, it's, it's not, uh, the book is not a conspiracy theory, it's not the protocols of the elders of Zion. Uh, and I don't think there's like some secret, you know, office in, in Washington or New York or San Francisco where the committee of the ruling class gets together. It's just that when power is unevenly distributed among social groups, 
uh, and individuals pursue their own interests, the result, even though it is not in, there's no coordination, is going to look as though the class is doing it, when in fact it's just the result of a lots of uh, individual actions. Uh, if you look at uh, public policy uh, from, from the uh, 1990s to the present, globalization. Uh, one, one of the things that just amazes me as a student of politics all my life is the unwillingness of people to acknowledge that there are trade-offs with, with uh, trade, with immigration, with investment, that different groups in society, some benefit, some lose. Uh, there's this constant din of propaganda. Free trade benefits everybody. Uh, Large-scale, low-skill immigration benefits everybody. Uh, and you, you just think, well, this is totally unrealistic. They're winners and they're losers. But it's because, so that's, that's part of the war. When the, the policy that benefits the winners is the one that is just, is the only one that is defended in public and the only one you hear. And it becomes taboo to discuss the views of the losers. That's the kind of war. Yeah, and I want, I want to spend some time just, on Just quick, quick on that. I mean, the way that I think about this, Marshall, is what are the institutions that the working class has depended on in the recent past to actually ensure that it has equal bargaining power, or at least some measure of bargaining power? So, you know, classic story, labor union, right? So private sector labor union participation in the late 50s, I believe, was what, 33, 35%. Right. It's now 6% basically been decimated. That's primarily a globalization story. It's not sort of a right to work story. Um, though I'm not a fan of right to work. It is a primarily globalization story. Um, the church, right, classic institution that both cements working class social, um, social, the social fabric, and also ensures that working class participants have some meaningful participation in the direction of the culture, the direction of the public policies that, you know, influence that culture. Uh, working class church participation has fallen off a cliff since the 1950s. And then the third, I think the big one is, is family, right? These are the sort of the, the, the place in which working class children grow up, hopefully in stable, healthy, happy homes. We know, of course, now that marriage is increasingly becoming a luxury good. Working class family formation, working class family dissolution has dropped pretty substantially. Um, professional class family formation and family stability has maintained more or less the level with a slight decline where it was in the 1950s or 60s. And so all of these institutions that are sort of necessary in ensuring that working class people are actually able to both live happy lives, but also have a meaningful stake in the society that they live in, have basically either disappeared or become substantially weakened in the past 50 years. So you know, the, the addendum, I would say, is if there's been a, a class war in the past 50 or 60 years, it's pretty clear who's losing. Right. And so from that perspective, I mean, I agree with all of this. And yet the critics, and specifically of your book, Michael, that have come out, and of this JD, is they'll say, you are apologizing and, and conflating economic anxiety, which is they say is a right-wing talking point for the actual just racial resentment. But you, you know, counter that in, your, in a recent piece you wrote in the Wall Street Journal, citing an MIT study, that you know, counties that were hit hardest by Chinese import competition were most likely to support Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. And so if that were the case, then why would they be supporting somebody like Bernie Sanders? And JD, of course, I, I want to get you in on that after to, to talk specifically about the economic anxiety piece being really you know, demonized as really just a, apologism for racism. Well, there are three narratives about this populist uh, uprising that has produced uh, Trump in the US and Brexit and the Yellow Vest revolts in France and so on. One is, it's just this spontaneous eruption of neo-Nazi racism, which maybe was manipulated by Vladimir Putin from the Kremlin, and he right. just triggered this uh, wave of you know, boys from Brazil, white nationalists, about to overthrow democracy in the US and the UK and France and so on. Uh, you, you can tell what I think of that. That's a, that, that's, <laughs> that's a partisan alibi yeah. for the loss of Hillary Clinton and Jeremy Corbyn. Yes. Uh, it's, it's not a serious story. More serious is the story, well, it's about money. Uh, it's, it's about rising inequality. And progressives in particular, they like to have this graph of the Great Compression. And it goes down from the 1920s, and then it goes up again. Uh, and if it's just about money, then you have after-tax redistribution, and you just give these working class people checks, and they'll be happy. And the story I tell in the new class war is it's about power. Power is independent of money. 
uh, that is power, the ability to influence your life, your, to influence your society. And, there, and power exists outside of the narrow governmental realm. Uh, and libertarians get upset with me for this point. Uh, but there is economic power in the marketplace. You, you do not have equality of bargaining power between most employers and most employees. There is cultural power in the media. Uh, if, if you uh, don't like the offerings for your children that you find on TV or in the movies or whatever, you, know, you can't just go found your own movie studio or found your own social media platform. That, that's power. Uh, and uh, particularly for Americans, the basis of the American creed was what in the 18th century they called Republican liberty, the idea that you could not trust concentrated power of any kind, economic. They didn't have media back then, uh, but, but, or political power. And diffusing power and having checks and balances is good in and of itself. Uh, and I think we've kind of lost this with this narrative about it's all about money. And if, if we centralize and hoard power, but we give you a $500 tax credit or a $2,000 tax credit every year, then you should be happy. Right. And I, I, yeah, please, J.D. Well, I, I was just going to say, so I, I'm not a fan of what I would call the crass materialistic view of economic anxiety led to Trump. I think it's much more complicated and difficult than that. You know, it's not just not having a good job or not having a decent wage or even not having enough money to afford the things you need. That's part of it. But it's also, you know, looking outside your door and seeing a community that was thriving 20 or 30 years ago and now every single store downtown is closed up. Or finding out yet again that one of your friends or one of your, your kid's friends has died of an opioid epidemic. That's not economic in a strict sense, but it's still very much about this feeling of, of losing agency, of losing power over your own life. Um, the, the, the related point that I make about this, and I, I make this point a fair amount, but I think it's important, so I'll make it here again is you have to understand what the purpose is of the narrative that Trump voters were motivated by pure racism or pure racial anxiety. If they're just racist, if they're just bad people, then you don't have to care about their concerns or about their worries. And we know two things very substantially about the Trump vote. Uh, one is that it was really related to the decline of manufacturing jobs, primarily caused by the China shock, which David Altour and other folks have written about. Uh, we also know that it was heavily related and tied to the rise in what you know, folks have called deaths of despair. That when you see a rise in opioid-related deaths in a given community, you also see a significant shift from Romney to Trump in 2016. Well, if you're focused on the fact that all these people are racist, then you're not concerned about the fact that a member of the elite that Mike Lind is so concerned about actually caused an opioid epidemic Purdue Pharmaceuticals, flooded these communities with drugs, killed a whole lot of people. And if we're not talking about that, if we're talking about Trump voters' racism, then we're just participating in the class war that the elites have already been, I think, winning for the past few decades. Yeah. So how do we, in good faith, balance the race and the cultural issue? Because the thing that the critics, the critics, the critics I think are doing this in bad faith point out is a true fact, which is the country is changing. Um, the country's white majority is, is, is shrinking. And the, the, the places that are most experiencing that anxiety are also sort of also being crossed hit by those same economic factors. So how do we, how do we handle that? Right? So, so how, how do we, because I, I, th I think the one legitimate part of the critique is just the idea that there is actually this big cultural shift going on. And it's unclear that the American right right now is doing a very good job of handling that. I think part of it is that it has to be managed in a particular way, right? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm married to, I guess, a first-generation immigrant. I've never felt once in my life that we didn't belong to part of the same national community. That's important. I think you want people who are, um, you know, who, who feel like they themselves are assimilating if they're newcomers. You want people who have been here for multiple generations to feel like the newcomers are they them, themselves. Um, assimilating as well. And I, I think one of the problems with our modern immigration policy, we talk a lot about it in economic terms, and that's fine, and it's an important piece of the story. Uh, but, but unless you're sort of thinking about intermarriage rates, unless you're talking about other metrics of assimilation, uh, unless you're trying to manage and control that in a way that's good for the overall population, for the overall country, then I, I do think that you can sort of inflame some of these cultural or racial or ethnic tensions. Um, that is true across history and across societies. There is no good example of a society that has absorbed a very large number of outsiders 
very quickly, very easily without social strife. Now, you can blame that on racism if you want to, but it's a fact of life. And if racism is what you're going to call it, then you have to manage it. You have to deal with it. You have to try to tamp it down and, I think, sort of suppress it in a certain way. And I do think that one thing that American elites, because we're so uncomfortable talking about culture and the importance of assimilation, uh, that we've stopped trying to manage it. We've stopped trying to actually build a unified nation out of the multiracial democracy that we have. And I, I like that multiracial democracy. I think it brings a lot of benefits. But I also think that it, it, it brings some challenges, too. And that if you're not smart about those challenges, then you can cause a lot of social strife, which is, of course, what we've seen in America. But we've seen much worse in Europe, right? Western Europe is a much, much worse example of this problem than the United States is. What do you think, Michael? Well, 100 years ago in 1920, there was a deep, deep political and social divide between old stock Anglo-American Protestants and uh, white Americans of recent immigrant descent, or sometimes not so recent in the case of the Irish Americans and the Germans. Uh, and it, it uh, gummed up redistricting because of the battle between the rural whites and the uh, urban so-called ethnics. Uh, you had prohibition. That was a war between the, the Catholics and the Protestants. You know, you had the beginnings of multiculturalism, people saying, why should the European immigrants speak English? Okay, flash forward to the 1970s. Uh, the European diasporas had collapsed in, in uh, most of the big cities in the north, or were eroding very quickly. By the 1970s, the average white American was partly of British and partly of non-British descent. So my question is, we hear all of this about the, the rising non-white majority, uh, but that's counting every descendant of someone who is a, not a non-Hispanic white will be non-white for the next 200 years, right? No matter what their other ancestry is. Uh, Richard Alba and uh, uh, a professor named uh, Stephen Trejo at the University of Texas at Austin have, have looked at Latino uh, rates of assimilation and intermarriage. Uh, Latinos lose Spanish as the primary language and marry outside of their group at exactly the same rate that the Irish Americans and the German Americans and the Polish and Italian Americans did a century ago. So I would go further. I think this, the supposed racial polarization of politics is greatly exaggerated. Mm. Uh, if you look at every group except for African Americans, who have this kind of 90-10 pattern with 90% with the Democrats and maybe 10% with the Republicans, the other groups are less polarized, including uh, Asian Americans and, and uh, Hispanic Americans and non-Hispanic whites. Non-Hispanic whites are very evenly divided. I mean, that was Hillary Clinton and, and uh, Donald Trump. Uh, so th it's not polarized in that sense. Uh, uh, Latinos, uh, depending on in state politics, in my home state of Texas, about 40% went for uh, Governor Abbott, 29% uh, uh, voted for Donald Trump. Well, if, you, if your definition of polarization is anything that's not 50-50, that's polarized. Right. But, but it's not enormously polarized. I think that's an important part of the story. I want to shift the discussion more to one of the criticisms of populism, of people who advocate for populist politics. I'm not saying that's what you're doing here, is that, oh, you guys are just shouting at the system, and you don't actually advocate for anything. You don't actually want to have a pure, you just want to tear everything down. You're actually somewhat sympathetic to that view. So tell us about what the actual, sim why, why do you think it is that populists themselves are not actually good at governance? Well, I'm, I'm a critic of populism. I argue we don't want to be caught in a doom loop between an exclusive uh, insider politics of well-connected establishments and the occasional outsider who comes and you know, represents protest. That's a terrible situation to be in. It was, it was the politics of the American South between Reconstruction and the Civil Rights Revolution. You've heard of the Southern demagogue, right? Uh, when you get a condition, when much of the population is just disconnected from everything and excluded from politics and from uh, uh, cultural authority, you're going to get demagogues arise to represent them. So I think this is dangerous. Uh, the, the demagogues, and I, if you look at the, the Southern example, uh, if you look at Latin America, you, in the North you find this with uh, so-called white ethnic politicians in the Northeast. Uh, Mayor Michael Curley, has anyone ever uh, uh, heard of Mayor Curley from uh, Boston? So, so he, he represented the Irish Americans rebelling against the Anglo-American WASP Mayflower Protestant power structure. 
you know, in the South, it was Huey Long representing poor whites against, against the establishment. Uh, they almost always fail because the odds are stacked against the outsiders, right? They don't have the money or the power or the connections, and so they can get elected once or twice, but they lose. Uh, they don't have the people willing to work for them who are insiders uh, because that's a career suicide. Uh, when they do succeed, often it's through dubious uh, a combination of criminality and charlatanism because they have to be financed somehow. You know, you get this kind of Eva and Juan Perón situation. Uh, in my own native Texas, we had two populist governors, uh, James and Miriam Ferguson, his wife. They succeeded each other in the 1920s, known as Pa and Ma Ferguson. And uh, they did some good things for the farmers who were frozen out, but they financed themselves by selling pardons to the parents of criminals in Huntsville prison. Uh, Huey Long in Louisiana couldn't get any money uh, for his populist insurgency, so he went into business with Frank Costello of the Chicago Mafia and brought in uh, slot machines. And so the source of uh, Huey Long's patronage as a populist governor was the slot machine money and was also something they called the deduct box. Uh, every two weeks, a certain portion of every state employee's pay was deducted. Uh, and put in, it was actually a chest, it was a box, and when he was assassinated, they, you know, it was like the, the atomic nuclear football with the president. Uh, so, so I think it's a, uh, at best, populism introduces new themes and outsiders, but you have to have some kind of reconstruction program. So let's talk about that, J.D., as somebody who has a foot in both worlds. How do you navigate the professionalism needed to enact populist reforms? Are they too at odds? And what do you think of Michael's prescription here going to the cure that he proposes later on for an actual settlement? Yeah, well, I, I, I do think, you know, on the one hand, there are some specific policy ideas out there. I mean, you know, something I'm a big fan of is Warren Cass's views on how you might reinvigorate a private sector labor union in the 21st century with all the pressures that exist economic and, le and legally, try to make them a little bit less confrontational, a little bit more compromising, but also give them new legal and institutional benefits so they can actually survive in a 21st century um, hyper-globalized economy. So I think the policies are in some ways out there, but I actually agree with that critique lar largely because I do think that most of the details of what a modern, call it populist, call it class compromise, uh, politics would look like are, are not actually there. We have to figure that stuff out. I, I will say that you know I, I really worry about the the sort of the political economy piece of this. This goes to your question about navigating these various worlds. I mean, Mike and I were talking about this earlier. If you were to sort of collect uh, the call it right populist people who can engage meaningfully with a quantitative economics paper. You know, may, maybe like 40% of them are on this stage right now. Um, you know, take out Warren Cass, you've got another, you've got another 60%. So, so, so it is a small group. And there is a way in which the institutions, um, you know, of this town in particular, I think are just not really well suited to this particular moment. Uh, I really worry about the fact that we, we don't actually have um, enough of the sort of think tank intellectuals we don't have enough of the administrators. We don't have enough of the people who would actually work in government. There, there's a lot that's missing. There's a lot of institution building that needs to be done. And so I, I think the criticism that there aren't a whole lot of populist-specific policies is fair. I also think that to build those things, you first have to sketch out a general way of thinking about how to settle these issues and then hopefully start to build the institutions out from there. But we're, we're still pretty early days on that. So I think the sort of sum up idea that you have, Michael, is that Post-World War II, we sort of framed this through three different ways. You had economic power, you had cultural power, and you had political power. Um, on the economic side, if you're a working class person, you had your union. You could check corporate power. On the cultural side, you had, and this is sort of funny, I learned this reading the book, you know, you had censorship organizations that checked Hollywood. And actually, it, was, it produced a lot of like really bad cultural stagnation, like some really bad movies came out. But at the same time, if we look at things like movies being financed by Chinese companies, and then we throw up our hands saying, well, I guess Tom Cruise is going to be anti-Japan now. I guess we can't really do anything about that. You, you see why those matter. And then finally, on the, on the political side, and this is another thing that was hard for me to reconcile, is you had those sort of like local corrupt political strongmen back home in the state legislatures, who on the one hand we sort of see as corrupt, we sort of see the primary system existing to put them apart, but on the other hand, they were much better capable of checking political power in Washington. Why did that whole status quo fall apart? Well, uh, there were different reasons for, the, for these different uh, realms, and 
the realm of uh, censorship. Well, let me preface this by saying that the working class exercised its power by veto power. It's, it did not have the resources uh, or the expertise you know, to come up with its own plans. The strike or the threat of a strike is a veto that forces management to reconsider. The uh, Catholic Legion of Decency got the Hollywood uh, producers to run Hollywood scripts past them in advance, right? They could say no, they didn't write movies themselves. Uh, the, uh, uh, the local political bosses could say no to a candidate, right? We didn't have self-financed candidates. Uh, the local political bosses were important because this was someone you could go to see in your neighborhood uh, if you had a problem. Uh, they connected you with the state party and the national party. Uh, many of them were quite corrupt. Uh, a friend of mine used to go around the 1960s with uh, Bobby Kennedy giving so suitcases of walking around money to Carmine DeSapio, the boss of the Bronx, and, <laughs> and, and we had the equivalent in, in the South in the courthouse gangs. So the only thing worse than having these local party power brokers is not having them, is not having them. Because when they all vanish, then the party becomes a label that billionaires like Tom Steyer and Michael Bloomberg and Donald Trump can buy. Uh, just out of, before, before coming here a few days ago, I went uh, to the website just of the Democratic Party out of curiosity. Uh, so my grandmother, who grew up on a farm in uh, central Texas, uh, she and her African-American friends uh, after the Civil Rights Revolution, had, uh, uh, very similar backgrounds, high school educated, they were part of the Travis County Democratic Party, you know, and they were part of the precinct machinery and all of that and did election work and so on. So I went to the Democratic Party to see how I could join. And they just had a donate button. <laughs> I tried the national and the state and the county. It was donate. Right, which kind of tells you something about the structure of politics. Now it's a spectator sport, uh, unless you're a donor, uh, a a pollster, uh, or a candidate. So to finish up, then, what does, in both your views, a new 21st century class settlement look like? Whether that's politically, economically, or culturally. Because, and then the last thing to add then to on top of that is what I like you say is that there's no victory in these wars. It's about a settlement. There's no world where conservatives win everything and liberals win everything. That's a problem with our political discourse. So what does a new settlement look like? Well, uh, to preface that, in the new class war, I argue that you want to have another class peace treaty. You want to have class peace. Uh, industrial capitalism is the greatest engine of economic development in human history. Uh, so you, you do not want the employer class to run amok. But you also don't want the working class to be so powerful it stifles growth. If we were in a different situation, where the managerial class was too weak and organized labor was too powerful, I would have written a different book. Uh, so I, what, what I say is we need to have the functional equivalent of some of these membership organizations. And, and in the new class war, I call them the ward, that is the local political entity of some kind. It doesn't have to resemble the old uh, political machine. Uh, the congregation, which can be and increasingly will be a secular creed, not necessarily a religious creed, as the US becomes more secular like uh, Western Europe. Uh, and, and I use the term the guild to uh, uh, encompass all kinds of alternative labor organization of the kind that uh, JD was uh, talking about in connection with uh, Warren Cass's ideas. So these things will not look like the unions and churches and political machines in 1950, but they would serve some of the same purpose, mainly in, in pooling the numbers of working class people. Because if you're working class, you don't have access to financial resources you, you know, to influence society. You don't have expertise to influence policy. All you have is your numbers. And unless those numbers are organized in some kind of disciplined institutional way, you lack power. JD, one, one thing I'd like to get from you before you launch also into your settlement idea is about what type of mental break does this require? from a kind of baked in ideology that has been on the right now for decades to even consider these as viable solutions to help the working class? Uh, five seconds or less. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that it, it first of all, you know, it, it, it requires us to think about, well, I, I think it requires us to imagine a world in which 
effective government is actually better than no government. And I think it requires a willingness to acknowledge that public policy at different levels actually might be useful in solving some of these problems. I, I do think that we've undergone this weird transformation in the last 30 years. I mean, I grew up in you know, this, this, this world reading conservative publications, being influenced by them, where we made some leap from the private sector is generally the right engine to do things to the public sector is always the wrong engine to do things. And that's a pretty terrible way to think about the world when you're engaged in politics and public policy. It's like surrendering before you even start the conversation. Um, so you know, my, my answer on, on class settlement, I mean, I, I, I don't know that I have a very good answer. I, I would say it, it probably looks something like what Mike just said that it looked like. You have reinvigorated community institutions, mediating institutions at the working class level. You have you know, some rise in participation in whether it's church or something that's sort of local and communal. It's, it, it's that you have actual worker organizations that can push for their interests and advocate um, for, for, for their membership. But I, I do worry, you know, when I think about this book, which by the way, I think is excellent, and I encourage everybody to buy and everybody to read and engage with, um, I, I worry that we're incapable of actually solving a lot of the problems that Mike writes about. And if I'm gonna put my pessimist hat on for a little while, it's not that we reach this sort of juncture five or 10 years from now where we really start to solve things, but that we undergo a 10 to 15 to 20 year period of sort of managed decline, and then hopefully we're able to solve those things. Uh, I, I, I do think that there's just a way in which our politics is so fundamentally broken. Uh, the institutions are broken. The, you know, I, I don't even know what Congress actually does right now. I mean, it's apparently sort of you know, looking at an impeachment trial. Turn on trial. your TV. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, you know, but it seems sort of, it, it's all very late Roman Republicish. Yeah. And that really, really worries me. And I, I don't know what the answer is out of that conundrum. Um, but I, I think that if there is an answer that we're willing to push for, then we, you know, we should be, we should be paying attention to this guy. Can I, can that, I add yeah. one optimistic note? We need those. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, that's a bleak assessment. <laughs> Well, there's a story that uh, yeah. uh, the economist and, and philosopher Adam Smith had a young research assistant who was reading the newspaper one day, and the British fleet had suffered some reverse in a battle with the French somewhere. And so he excited. He came to Professor Smith, and he said, uh, Britain is ruined. And uh, Professor Smith said, young man, there's a great deal of ruin in a country. <laughs> <laughs> So more to yeah. come. Yeah. <laughs> so I, we're going to move a little on to Q&A. I've got some actually really great questions here. And I think one of the names, I think we only talked about him once, was actually Donald Trump. And it's interesting, I mean, on this podcast, a, a political realignment sparked by the President of the United States, how actually often we don't end up talking about him. And I think that this, this is one of the central questions I've seen about this administration. This question is, is Trump still at the forefront of the realignment? Or has he governed more like a pre-Trump Republican, i.e. prioritized tax cuts, called for increased immigration, saying business needs, uh, sees, uh, I, I'm assuming high-skilled workers is what they meant here, et cetera. Well, how do you think of Trump within the context of the new class war? Well, let me, let me say that I've, from the beginning, I thought Trump had less to do with uh, Mussolini and Hitler than with Arnold Schwarzenegger and his friend Jesse Ventura. Mm. Uh, Trump and Ventura <laughs> tried to take over the Reform Party in 2000, right. Ross Perot's yeah. Reform Party. And when you get these celebrity outsider presidents, uh, they have two choices. One is if they run nominally as the, the leader of one of the two parties in the United States, they can either govern, once they're elected, as more or less conventional Republicans or Democrats, or they can try to, try to triangulate between the two. Uh, from the very beginning, Trump uh, became a Republican. He had not been a Republican for most of his life. Evidently, he was a Democrat or independent. Uh, but that was the fundamental strategic decision he made, I think, with the tax cut, uh, with, with a lot of other things, with one exception. Uh, the exception is foreign policy, where the president has far more discretion than in domestic policy, where if you, you're, you're much more dependent in your own party in Congress. And there, I think, I think he has made a difference. That is, uh, his, uh, uh, George W. Bush left the country with two ongoing wars in Afghanistan and in uh, Iraq. Uh, Obama was elected because he was going to end the wars. Uh, 
So he added three more in Syria, in Libya, and in Yemen. <laughs> to date, despite the Iran thing, uh, Trump has not added a, 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 you know, yet a sixth war. Uh, and he seems to favor theatrical displays of force as an alternative to deeper engagement, right? Kind of postponing it. The, and the other area where I think he has shown uh, his own predilections is trade. Yes. Uh, by, by bringing in Robert uh, Lighthizer, very accomplished USTR, who was a Democrat, right? He's not a Republican up until he switched in, I think, 2016 or 2017. Uh, so, so I think, you know, Trump, uh, and I'm just, you know, inferring this from his actions, decided, okay, I'm going to write a blank check to the Bush-Ryan Republicans in Congress on domestic policy, but I'm going to push my priorities in foreign policy and particularly in trade. What do you think, J.D.? Yeah, I think that the, the first couple of years of the administration definitely illustrated the institutional weakness that we've been talking about this evening, where um, the, the apparatus of Republican domestic policy, that, right? This, this is not heritage in 1981 that was like ready for the Reagan revolution. This was a group of people who were largely blindsided. And when they got the opportunity to actually govern, they went back to the old playbook that they've sort of relied on for the past 15 or 20 years. Uh, so so I, I don't think you've seen a substantial sort of realignment um, in, in how things have actually gone. Uh, the, the, the political piece of it still continues. I still think that you see the shifts. I think Republicans now own 20 of the poorest congressional districts in the country. So there is a weird way where the policy hasn't quite quite caught up to the politics. The one thing I'd add, sort of as a specific iteration of what, of what Mike talked about with trade and, and Bob Lighthizer, is that uh, the China issue, Trump, I think, deserves remarkable credit for shifting the entire national conversation. Uh, it's tough to overstate how different the elite consensus was in 2014, even, relative to today. Uh, we all sort of get, with the exception of maybe uh, the Democratic frontrunner, that China is a significant problem, both economically and in a national security sense. And uh, I, I really think that the credit for changing that conversation, that narrative, uh, goes largely to the 2016 election and, and, and Donald Trump. I think that's that's absolutely right. I mean, you see even on the Democratic stage, only one candidate's definitive said he would take away the China tariffs. Yep. And most of them said they were going to vote for his trade deal with NAFTA. I mean, if that's not a political realignment, yep. I'm not sure what is. I think this is an interesting one. Uh, which asked about what are the some of the least economically. I do want to just. This is like a okay. lightning round, so we should. Yes. Try to, oh, sorry. What are, they, uh, <laughs> what are the least economically disruptive Answer policies? Answer faster is what you're telling. That could be implemented to restore a more even balance of power between capital and labor. What do you think, Michael? I guess we'll keep it to ones. It's a lightning round. Tight, least uh, tight labor markets. There we go. That that is uh, labor naturally wants to have a seller's market and uh, a buyer's market in labor. Right. Uh, I mean, a seller's market in labor, and the employers want a buyer's market in labor. So there, that's, that's the basic. That's why uh, from the 1820s up until the 1990s, the American labor movement tended to be for more restrictive immigration policies, and the employer elite wanted uh, looser and, and more generous immigration policies. As the former country club Republicans have become the new you know, coastal Democrats, uh, or their children and grandchildren have, you know, you, you have seen that shift in the employer perspective versus the employer perspective. But even if you don't do anything else for labor, if you have tight labor markets, and it's not simply immigration, it's uh, uh, paid uh, vacations, it's maybe uh, early retirement, things like that. Anything that makes employers compete for workers uh, is, can help their bargaining power. Eddie. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, if I was going to give a second answer, it's, it's maybe a substantial increase in R&D spending. I, I do think that if the working class is going to do better in the country, we do have to actually restart productivity. Um, it, it's, it's sort of stagnated the past 20 or so years, and I think that's primarily a lack of technological innovation story. Uh, so I agree with Mike, but I'd add maybe some, some more spending on R&D so that we can get you know, the economy in a position today like it was in the 50s and 60s. All right, so it, here's the next question. Is incorporating working class, these are very well re researched and written, so thank you. Very impressive, uh, everyone. Yeah, is incorporating the working class majorities into Western democracy not just a similar attempt at saving capitalism as FDR carried out through making marginal adjustments to ensure the system remains viable? And if we do redistribute power and money, would they just not make the current winners losers and the current losers winners and not actually correct anything, Michael? No, I disagree with that. I agree with the... Uh, 
FDR parallel, but it was also Churchill in the UK after 1945. It was Adenauer and the Christian Democrats in Germany. It was Charles de Gaulle in France. You had these post-war settlements, uh, and they they thought, and having gone through war, uh, they had a vision, at least for a while, of capital and labor as partners in a common project of national and and regional reconstruction. They weren't battling to the death. Obviously, there were Marxists on the left and and some libertarians on the right, but. That was the vision. I think we can go back to that. Does it? The people who, who benefit from this in the long run are the privileged if they can preserve their privileges by making strategic concessions to the working class. There's a story about Joseph Kennedy, the, the financier, father of uh, John F. Kennedy and, and Bobby and Ted Kennedy. Uh, he was asked why he uh, supported Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. Uh, and he said, uh, I would give away half my fortune to keep the other half. Mm. What do you think? Yeah, I, I just I, I agree with Mike, and I, I would say historically, if you look at the post-war and sort of you know post-depression, call it societies that engaged in you know whether we're going to call it Leonine corporatism or Lindian class compromise, uh, the UK and the United States stand at the top of that list. If you look at some of the societies that refused to engage in that sort of compromise, um, you know you'd include Russia, Italy, and Germany, and we know how it went for those guys. I, I do think that there's something. You know, pretty unpredictable about political instability, and it's best uh, in, in general to try to uh, reform the system as best you can, as opposed to assume that one group is going to triumph because they typically don't, and even if they do, it's not necessarily good for everybody. Mm. Another theme that we touch on here at the realignment, with the current information revolution ongoing, that includes computers, automation, social media, communications, etc. Talk about the cumulative impact of the information revolution on the class war, as you describe it in losing power and influence, Michael. I think you know specifically that we frame kind of a big tech and, and the internet specifically. Yeah, I, I think you uh, it, there's there's a radical difference in how media are used by the social classes. There are all these studies showing that people on Twitter are overwhelmingly college-educated people. Uh, the uh, working class gets much more of its information from old-fashioned television uh, and from podcasts, of course. Yes. Uh, no, I think this is probably more the first group. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, from radio, uh, because they're in their cars, you know, in, in their jobs. Uh, I wouldn't exaggerate the role of media that much because first with television and then with uh, the, you know the internet, there's this tendency to think that people are terribly malleable and can be mesmerized and hypnotized by by the media. I mean, this is the basis of the whole Russian conspiracy theory that that Russian memes brainwashed African Americans into not voting for Hillary and and you know this other group into voting for Trump. Uh, I remember back in the 70s, there was a, a study that showed when Norman Lear's All in the Family came out, it was supposed to promote liberal values. But most of the people who watched it thought that Archie was the hero, Archie Bunker, and that the whole point of the show was to make fun of the college-educated meathead. So people can filter the media. They have, they have mentalities and cultures of their own. Yeah, I may be a little bit more conspiratorial and worried about this uh, modern IT than, than Michael Lind is. I mean, when, when, I, when I go to a restaurant with my family and I see basically half of the tables and you say all the kids are sort of staring at their devices and the parents are even staring at their devices and they're not speaking at each other. And then you recognize that fundamentally the modern IT business model is largely built on what you know, others have called information arbitrage. Every second that you're spending staring at that device as opposed to reading a book or communicating with your family is a dollar of revenue that they make. And they're very good at making devices that make you stare at those, those things as long as possible. And I, and I think that there's something very disturbing about the way that it captures our attention, about the way that it makes us less productive, about, you know, I've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs um, who are really worried about the effect that it has on productivity in their workforce, that people are working eight, nine hours, but maybe they're only actually working four or five hours because they're so absorbed in, in their devices. So I, I, I do worry about this, and I think that you know one way of uh, taking power away from the working and middle class is to hypnotize them, and I don't necessarily think that's what we're doing, but I think it's probably truer than treating cell phones as comparable to just TV or some other you know electronic innovation. So the last question that we have here is about education, and it's about if education is the cross-cutting kind of political cleavage that transcends shared interest and it stokes class divisions. How are we to find some equitable society 
which isn't, it just doesn't share the same level of education. What do you think, Martin? Well, it depends on what, if the education is useful to people or not. As I pointed out earlier, uh, arguably, Americans are overeducated in as much as, you know, different studies show 10 or 15 percent of jobs being done by people with BAs do not require anything more than a high school education. Uh, and so I think, if anything, it's worse for society to have people have, have this sense of disconnect between their highfalutin degrees and their perfectly respectable working class jobs, but they feel that they, they, they're degraded because these are not, this is not the income they expected from the degree or it's not the status they expected. Uh, so now in, in terms of, there's a kind of version of progressivism uh, that says, well, if, every, if professionals make more money, we'll make everyone a professional and then everyone will make more money. Well, if you do that, if you give everyone a BA, it then becomes like a high school diploma or a GED, and you get a society of uh, Don Quixotes. You may remember Don Quixote was a Hidalgo. He was an aristocrat who had no money. Uh, and that, that's, uh, you, you don't necessarily want that kind of society. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical that our elite education system works especially well. There's always this debate about whether elite education is primarily signaling or whether it's primarily human capital development. And if you want to test that theory on the people who are the, the most powerful advocates that it's human capital development. Uh, go to Yale Law School, which has an average class size of 200. It's, you know, of course, where I went to school. And tell the administrators there, tell the students, tell the donors, tell the people who are alumni that we should triple or quadruple the average size of Yale Law School's class. Uh, well, if it's such a great education, we're just developing human capital, we should be giving it out to as many people as possible. Uh, but of course, that deflates the value the exclusiveness of the degree. And I think so much of what we're doing with modern education is just social signaling. And I, you know, if we don't get out of that trap, if we don't stop spending so much money on it, I think we're just screwed. Well, on that note. very optimistic <laughs> note, it's been a very optimistic evening. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. <laughs> I appreciate it. And I'll sign books. Yes, and Michael will be signing books in the back. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Yes, sir. That's great.